John Ralston Saul is also a really remarkable um, public intellectual. He's known around the world. He's been elected as the president of PEN, the uh, international writers organization that uh, has had very few North Americans, in fact, ever uh, leading it. And so I'm looking forward very much to hearing John Austin Saul's remarks today. And this evening he commented that if he hadn't have been a writer, he might have liked to have been an architect. So John Austin Saul, welcome. It just misses him. It 
just this is it. And um, now here's the point I want to make. Here's the point I want to make. I'll just leave it with this. This is pointing at Laurier. There are five rifles and cannons in this statue, two of them being fired. This is on Parliament Hill. This is probably the only parliament in the world, including Washington, where there is a statue, uh, uh, what was the phrase from the War Memorial? Um, glorifying armed conflict. I don't think there's a single parliament anywhere in the world which has a statue glorifying armed conflict and violence. They're firing it. And as a matter of fact, this was unveiled just before the poor demented guy shot the poor soldier and went on to Parliament Hill with a rifle, which he fired. And we said we're against violence, and we're particularly against violence in Parliament Hill because it's the center of peaceful speaking among peoples, and yet we've just placed on Parliament Hill the single most violent statue of any parliament in the world as far as I know. And I've seen many parliaments. I may have missed one. All right? And uh, that's the first point. The second point is as important, so I'll go back, which is you will notice that the British soldier is doing what he's supposed to do. He's firing his gun. Uh, professional. Of course, the man in the middle I've descended from is white and tall, and he's got his arm up because he's preparing to become, uh, uh, I don't know, Rocky or something. I mean, he's, the, he's the powerful victor. He's the important man. And then, of course, the native is crouching. Ottawa already went through this with the Champlain statue. And here's a brand new statue with the native crouching. Now, there's an interesting historical error, apart from the fact that it's racist. There's an interesting historical error, which, of course, the Aboriginals were not scouts in the War of 1812. They were the single most successful military arm that we had. And in the key battle, the Battle of Queens and Heights, which was being lost <laughs> by the British troops, when our great British hero, um, I forgot his name now, the commander, was shot charging up the hill, uh, Brock, uh, charging up the hill, the British troops were losing, the Loyalists were losing, and the natives from Six Nations came over the hill and turned the battle. So we actually won the War of 1812. The turning point was that battle, and it was turned by the Aboriginals. But we can't show that. We have to show the Aboriginals crouching so that the tall white guy that I'm descended from could be the dominant figure. <laughs> All right? So, and nobody is saying anything about this. This is an absolute scandal. It's a defamation of the planning of Parliament, of the concept of Parliament, of the idea of Parliament as a place to talk and not be violent. Nobody's saying anything apart from the racism. Nobody, I mean, nobody's, it's wrong for that reason. It's wrong because of the racism, and nobody's saying anything. You just might want to mention it. <laughs> and it's particularly offensive because it, it, it's overlooking the war memorial, which is of an enormous beauty and sophistication and power, which Canadians love because it's real and they feel it. They feel the sacrifice and the force at the same time without this sort of belligerent, superficial Hollywood movie stuff. So that's the first failure. The second one is completely off topic. It's just to do myself a little pleasure, which is, um, uh, which is this. This, as you may know, is the city hall of Oslo where the Peace uh, Prize is given out and all great events happen. Uh, this is the Lu Xiaobo, I'm President Penn. Lu Xiaobo was the president of the Chinese Independent Penn Center, and you know, he's in jail, he was our candidate. You see the empty chair, that's his chair, that's a Penn symbol. The, when we put a chair that's empty with the name of somebody who's in prison always, and they took it from Penn. There it is. That's the jury. This is the audience. Now, if you, if you um, look closely, that's me, right there. Right there, in the front row. I was there because I'm president of Penn and Lou Shelbo wasn't there. Um, and this is the cloakroom. This is the cloakroom because guess what? Norway's a northern country unlike Canada. That's a joke. Uh, uh, you'll see that there's a space for every letter. I think there may be X, Z, they share a space. But so if you're a C, you know, if you're, uh, if you're a Boreama, you go to M, you know, if you're a Cardinal, you go to there, you know, there's your spot. There, you see? And within three seconds, you've gotten rid of your coat, and at the end, three seconds and you're out, nobody puts their coats under their chairs. They've got plastic bags for boots. This is another northern city, not as far north. This is Berlin. This is the com uh, Comic Opera. I was just there the other day. Um, the front, it was bombed, so the front's 
pretty is what is there's the inside. Um, fabulous acoustics. And there are the is the coat check there. The same thing. It's gigantic coat check because guess what? It's, it's the northern part of Europe. I could take you to the opera house in Stockholm. I could take you to public building after public building after public building in the north, around the world, in every country except Canada. And the architects have put in large cloakrooms because they live in the north. Whereas Canadians, the colonial dreamers, believe that we live in Paris, London, or New York, or Florida. So we tuck tiny little cloakrooms into the basement so Canadians don't have very nice overcoats because they know they're going to have to roll them up and put them under their seats where the person behind will get their shoes on. So if you want to know why Canadians have crummy overcoats, that's the explanation. So I'm just suggesting that in the future you might think about putting in proper cloakrooms because we actually live in the north. It's just a point. Personal obsession. I wrote about this in Siamese Twins. I talked about it. I got nowhere. But I have you captive. Uh, now, this is the Great Ottawa River. Uh, these are the islands in the middle of the Ottawa River. Chief Spence, you see the island that far in those who aren't from Ottawa, the green one, that's Victoria Island. That's where she was when she was on her hunger strike during the Idle No More movement. The, the, the islands at this end, upriver, are, are uh, currently in the hands mainly of Don Tar. This is the sort of scene of various, you know, there's a, a, a dam there, there's the Chaudière Falls, some of the most beautiful falls in, 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 in eastern Canada, and it's all you know, rearranged slightly so they could run their factories, which are all gone, right? They don't exist anymore. And you'll see that's Parliament at the top of the picture. They have direct view onto Parliament, just down, uh, down there. Uh, there's another view, but you see there's Parliament. There are the islands. So there are three islands. There's, um, uh, it's, uh, Victoria is the one that's green. And, um, Chaudier and Albert. Chaudier and Albert, thank you very much. Uh, the big one is Chaudière, which is the one to the left, and Albert is just out of sight, sort of, I think it's a bit to, to the right. Um, and here is the plan, approved, approved by the NCC, the City of Ottawa, and others, to allow Domtar to take a central feature of our national capital and turn it into the headquarters of mediocre, probably, um, uh, condos and shopping centres about 18 to 20 buildings jammed onto these two islands uh, in full view of Parliament. So what this actually will mean is that the view, you know, it's the kind of the core of the national capital. You can start with Ray's fabulous museum, uh, war, war museum, and then you go up and then there's the quite interesting of its time uh, national library, and then of course there's the fabulous uh, Supreme Court with the strange roof that Mackenzie King insisted on putting on. You see, I do know my architecture a little bit. And then you have the, the fantastic Parliament buildings which pretend to be imitation Gothic, but are really these kind of uh, animist, crazy things pushing up out of the rock on the cliff, bringing Canada together, because that was the idea that was on the, sh on the cliff between Francophone and Anglophone Canada, bringing them together. And then you'll go across, of course, to Doug's fantastic uh, museum, and then there's a mess after that, and so let's accept that mess. But, but if this is built, if this is allowed to be built, I mean, look at it. It just looks like a slum, right? I know it's only a, a sort of box, it's a slum. Uh, that's what they want to build. If this is built, that means that the view that has existed for thousands of years from the Parliament buildings and everything else will look up river. It used to always look up into the heart of Canada, was the idea. It will look at a wall of condoms out of which Don Tar will have made a fortune, and the people in the condos on the, on the south side, I guess, will have a view you can't buy, and we will have a view of them. <laughs> so this is a, a frankly, in, from an ethical point of view, corrupt proposition. Uh, it's, a, it's a deformation of the original idea that Ottawa would be a joining together of Francophone, Anglophone, and as we started to learn, in the 60s and 70s, our rituals would be a great circle in the middle of the three founding peoples of the country. Um, and, and interestingly enough, you know, people always say who don't know Ottawa that it was just an artificially chosen capital by Queen Victoria. It's a total lie. She knew nothing about it. 
she was handed a piece of paper to sign. It had already been planned by uh, Johnny McDonald and Georgia Chen Karchi and the Governor General. And it was all done in Canada and then engineered because they didn't have the guts to do on losing an election at the time of local politics. Uh, and it was chosen for several reasons, but one of the reasons was that Ottawa was always an important place. For thousands of years, it was a meeting place between Aboriginal peoples. And this, those falls, those islands, are the heart of the meeting place. That's where Champlain went to do his deal on the way up the river. This is at the heart. And Canada's filled with cities that are on those sorts of sites, like um, Saskatoon, Quebec City, Montreal, Calgary, and Ottawa, and many, many others. It's quite natural. We have settled ourselves where Aboriginal people had chosen the best spots. Now, I'm not talking about the justice and injustice of it. I'm talking about the, 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 the built form in the right place, the planning of it. That's the spot. And unless you decide that this is an important issue, for you as the people who are the most respected people in Canada on the issue of architecture and planning, unless you say something, the national capital will in a sense have been sold off to a probably failing company to do what it wishes with the form and the idea of the national capital. The Cardinal's played a big role in pushing this, but I think you've got to get behind him, and I think you, your, your um, group has the kind of influence. Many people have already spoken up, but you need to speak up on this. Just some ideas. Of, it could be a place of, uh, uh, where Aboriginals working with Doug have talked about. You know, there could be some buildings which were meeting places of the cultures when people come to Canada. A place where Aboriginal leaders and Aboriginals could go and feel comfortable. It would be their land because it is whether Donatar has a temporary hold on it or not. It is in effect um, their land. And the last, just a little comment. I had the great fortune of knowing William Commander. I don't know how many of you ever knew him. Did anybody know him apart from the two of us? Yeah. William Commander was a great and very important figure who was the holder of various wampum belts which really were about, he was the carrier of the legitimacy of Ottawa as a meeting place. He was the memory of Ottawa as a meeting place, a great old chief, fat, tough as they come. I mean, really, you know, I don't know, he lived to be what? 90. I mean, I knew him sort of in his 80s and you always felt like if you disagreed with him he was going to knock you out or something, he was so tough. A great man, really, really a great man, and I just think that um, we'll be letting him down, we'll be letting ourselves down if we allow this to happen. Now, um, how much time have I left? Hardly anything. Take as much as you like. Right. <laughs> so, now, now the, this is really an introduction, and I, but, but the rest will be quite quick, to the fact that, you know, most of the architectural and planning and engineering work in Canada is done in the bottom 10%. There's some work done in the bottom 30% of the country, you know, up to Sudbury, sort of thing, uh, going across Shakuta, Shakuta Bay, and so on. The top two thirds of the country, which produces at least 50% of the GDP, okay, all these cities of ours would be poverty stricken if that we didn't have those top two thirds. That's where all the money comes from. Well, we're pretending it's all about lattes and espressos and, and you know, uh, computers. Actually, 50% of our GDP approximately, in fact, more than 20 years ago, comes out of the North. And we're still acting as if the North is only that, a place to take stuff out, not a place where people live. And that's what is stopping us from acting like a, a proper country. I don't mean in the nationalistic sense. A real place which believes it has responsibility in the land, for the land, with the land, which means a real relationship with Northerners, which, who are largely, but not entirely, Aboriginals. There are some really great buildings, and I mean, I just, I didn't have time, I got off a plane from Europe last night, but, you know, that's a, a, a wonderful Cree building in northern Quebec. Um, that's the inside of the Inuit Parliament. The outside's, I don't know, I hope you didn't build it somewhere here. I'm not a fan of the outside, but the inside is really great. Uh, this is a new um, cultural center in uh, Clyde River uh, on Baffin on the East Coast, which is a very interesting place. That's one of the inside meeting rooms. Uh, this, is, this is quite interesting because it's a southern building, but it's in Pond Inlet. I spent a lot of time there. I wrote one of my books in Pond Inlet in the middle of the winter. It's 24 hours dark. And this is the sort of library. And it's a real, it was an attempt at something in terms of the North. And it was a big deal in the North. It looks small to you, but it's a big deal in the North. Uh, this is Pond Inlet. You notice the planning. 
You notice the architecture. You notice the careful thought which has gone into it, the integrated approach, the imagination, the, the way the buildings fit in with the landscape, the color, the shape, the materials. You notice it, right? Um, this is, uh, this is a glue lick. I spent a lot of time in a glue lick. This is on the other side, on a sort of island off Baffin, and it's a fabulous place. Um, Zachary Kunuk, who made the, the Fast Runner, you know, great filmmaker, that the, the, the film program comes out of there again, the architecture, is some lovely, uh, are those um, trailers? Um, you know, I think that's the school on the right. You can see a lot of work's gone into that. Um, this is uh, Upper Wadiscot, which is the community of, of Chief Spence. Uh, you'll notice the uh, triumph of the very bottom of the barrel of southern suburban construction of the 1950s. This would have been put in in the 1990s, probably. Um, that was Wadiscot, triumph of southern civilization in architectural terms. Now, this is next door. This is the community next door, and it's just been sort of built, and you say, well, at least that looks okay. But look at that. What has that got to do with the Arctic, with the North? Tell me what that has to do with anything. It looks like sort of military housing just after the Second World War, and this is progress. This is progress. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that, I'm, no, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna leave it uh, staring at this. Um, uh, that your official vision in your paper says that you are the leading voice for excellence in the built environment in Canada, demonstrating how design enhances the quality of life while addressing important issues of society through responsible architecture. You believe in sustainable growth in our communities, uh, built form and natural environment, and you have a new policy which sounds fantastic. Um, what I'm saying to you is that, you know, countries have issues which come. There, there are many issues on the table. There's a you know, hundred major issues on the table and you put them in order and you say this is the most important one, this is the number two one. You look at different times and you say, got to deal with this issue now before it gets totally out of control. I'm telling you that the single most important unresolved issue, and I don't mean unresolved in the sense that you're going to fix a problem. I mean in the sense that the relationship between the non-Aboriginal Canadians and the rest of us is unsolved, resolved, unsettled, unthought through, and Canadians, including their architects, have not taken their responsibility in this area. This is the single most important unresolved issue on the table in Canada today. approximately 75 cents for their education, for every dollar which goes to non-Aboriginal kids, and for every dollar 25 approximately, which might go to the kids of new Canadians. That's as it should be, the dollar 25, if not a dollar 50, because we want new citizens to have a chance to get going as citizens as fast as possible. That's not a scandal at all. The scandal is the 75 cents, which is in effect a technical continuation of the residential schools. That's what that is. The refusal to finance their education program. You know the poverty levels. You know that again. This, you know, if we talk about um, uh, architecture, engineering, services, planning, etc., you know that that their, their water, or sewage uh, services are in a crisis across the country. I forget the numbers. It's something like half of the reserves are permanently without proper water and sewage. Walker didn't happen. We fixed it. We fixed it overnight. And incidentally, even though a large part of the blame was the local leadership, we didn't say, we won't give you back clean water until you clean up your leadership. We said the legal system will deal with the leadership, but we as citizens and government will deal with the clean water immediately because it is a right of citizens to be able to have clean water and good sewage systems. With our originals, we're trying to pretend and it's false, that until they get their act together, we're not going to go in and help. That's essentially what we're saying. And this is, uh, you know, I don't use the word, I don't use the word racist much. This is racist. This is old colonial politics. Uh, this is appalling. And I can tell you as somebody who travels, and I know architects travel a lot, but I, I mean, I'm in public positions, international president of Penn, and every meeting I have, every meeting I have with presidents of republics and prime ministers, 
ministers of justice, and I'm there to tell them about why they shouldn't be putting their writers in prison and killing their journalists and so on. Within 15 minutes, they say, yes, but you're Canadian, Mr. Sullivan. And then they start talking about how we handle Aboriginal questions appallingly in Canada. So I want to tell you, this is one of the most damaging elements in our international reputation, apart from being immoral, unethical, and frankly, criminal in a democracy. So the housing, there are some places where the housing is better. There's part, because of the big James Bay settlement, parts of the housing in Nunavik, northern Quebec, is really not bad at all. It's quite interesting. They've done some stuff themselves because they got a big chunk of money. The others have not received a big chunk of money to take control of their lives. The result is that the housing and the planning is essentially junk. Uh, we have a deep-seated problem that the Ministry of Indian Affairs, forget the fact it's renamed itself, it's still the Ministry of Indian Affairs, um, and the Ministry of Justice section that works with them is the biggest problem in the Canadian government, the most problematic department. And, um, and I would add to this that all of these intellectual studies of the Arctic are done from southern universities. We are the only circumpolar country which has no Arctic university because we can't afford it. Iceland can. We don't have a big enough population in the north. Actually, we have the second biggest population in the north after Russia. Um, uh, you know, there's excuse after excuse after excuse. It comes down to the fact that we're not treating northern two-thirds of Canada as if it were a place for people to live and be citizens in Canada. Um, there is a fascinating, tiny, sort of on-the-ground university called the Chinto in the Northwest Territories. It's 20 students a year, which has an experimental education on uh, traditional uh, indigenous life ideas and uh, lifestyles. But the southern universities are where the architectural schools sit. There's now, I've just been told, a new one in Sudbury. That will be the most northerly architectural school in Canada, which is in the bottom third. So there's nothing in the north, there's no ability to build up something for kids in the north. A place they could go and worship at the feet of great architects and learn in that way that people learn at universities from professors and visiting professors and some of you would come and talk and they would go, I could be an I could be like them, I could do that. That's what happens when you come. None of that, none of those possibilities exist in the northern two-thirds of Canada where 50% of the GDP is generated. So, um, I think there's an enormous obligation to start saying to yourselves, it's not, you know, there are colleges. It's, we need northern universities, and those northern universities have to have in some way architectural faculties which will allow us to think about what would it look like to design and think about communities in the north. Not you from the south coming and telling them, but you in the north and being with them and talking about what it would look like what it would feel like with the elders, the sense of the land, the sense of the materials, and so on. So, uh, you know, Canada has about 2,000 isolated communities. This is the reality of this country. I mean, we're going on and on about whether we're going to lose part of the Arctic and the undersea and access to oil and uh, how can we prove sovereignty in the Arctic by sending gunboats and uh, having soldiers and all that sort of stuff. They're, they're just about, they're opening soon a new research center, which they moved 12,000 kilometers south, by the way, from where the, the other one was. Um, so they didn't have to be too far north. And when you look at the, the specs, it's entirely, the Canadian research center in the Arctic is entirely, its program is entirely about resource extraction and development. It's not about the people in the north at all. And therefore, it's not about architecture, it's not about planning, it's not about sewage, it's not about water, it's not about energy, it's about extraction. So the real proof of legitimacy of Canada in the Arctic is that Canadians live in the Arctic and have lived there for thousands of years. But if you don't treat them like Canadians, why would anyone else in the world take us seriously on this issue? So at the moment, all of this is left to mid-level civil servants in the Department of Indian Affairs, the single most compromised department from an ethical point of view in the Canadian government with a terrible history, no transparency in its spending, no track record of success in architecture, planning, engineering, or services. A history of failure from the 1870s on. There isn't a single positive thing to be said about that department 
There's some nice people in it, but there isn't, they have not accomplished anything that we as a country can be proud of. So, just to finish, this should be at the very top of your concerns. I mean, you say I'm going to be provocative. I'm not provocative. I just have a tendency to run 10 to 20 years ahead. That's a joke. But on this, but on this issue, I'm not running ahead. I'm running behind. It's amazing that we have not done anything about this up to this point. It's an international embarrassment. It's the most obvious physical sign of failure in this country, of the most obvious single sign of the failure of built form, of architecture, of imagination, planning, engineering, and services in this country. Um, we should be, you should be, thinking and working on how can we make isolated communities work. Don't treat it as an expensive embarrassment. Why don't they come to Ottawa or Toronto or in Edmonton? Think of it as this is one of the great features of Canada. We have probably 2,000 communities, many of which only have winter roads. Some of them you could only fly into or go by boat to. This is an astonishing characteristic of this gigantic northern group of seven countries which says it can't afford an Arctic University. Right? It's an amazing thing. Canada could be a leader in how isolated communities should function. Uh, we should be seeing this as a great positive. We could be doing things that could be picked up all around the world. We should see it as a central characteristic of Canada as a northern nation. You're worried about Aboriginal kids, their health, suicides, drugs, and so on. Well, you need to be working with Aboriginal people in order to help them make their communities positive places, positive communities where the kids will feel they're meant to be there. That their education is not all about why am I here, why not, can't I leave here, which is what we're doing at the moment. They have a citizen's right to be treated by you and by me and by all of us in that way. Canada is not just about urban citizens with country houses and the odd city a couple of hours north of here by car. Um, Canada is shaped by the north. We have to figure out what kind of systems and architectural styles will work in the north, what kind of materials, what ways of living, what built form that matches the place. We have to work with indigenous people on the ideas, their ideas of community in order to come up with socially responsible architecture, which I believe is your phrase. This is a great challenge. This is the project, I think, of this generation of your presidency, sir, I think. A great challenge in your vice presidents. Uh, it's a test of leadership for all of us, but I think, frankly, at this point, you're the group with the engineers who are on the front line because it's the communities physically which are a failure and that physical failure has a major impact on everything else that's possible in those communities. So it's a test of leadership, of learning, of understanding. It's a test for you and since I adore all of you who I know in this room, which means I could probably adore the rest of you, I think you're perfectly up to it. Thank you very much.